Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar on the subject of Rios 2016. Just going to hang on for another minute and see if anyone else joins us before we go ahead and get started. Okay, so as I said, the subject of today's webinar is on the subject of Rios 2016. My name is Austin Matthews. Welcome. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. PJR is headquartered in Troy, Michigan, for those of you who don't know. Today's uh, agenda, we will cover a little bit about PJR. We'll highlight some of the benefits of certification to a standard such as RIOS. We will briefly reiterate the transition timeline for anyone that might have somehow missed this information, but the transition deadline to uh, RIOS 2016, if you were already certified to the previous version of RIOS, has already passed. So we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Instead, we'll focus on some of the key changes in RIOS 2016 compared to RIOS 2006, um, as well as just some of those key requirements for anyone who's trying to get more familiar with the RIOS standard. We'll do that at a high level and also through a clause by clause overview. I will close the presentation with a summary of the certification process for anyone who is pursuing certification for the first time and we'll close with any questions. So feel free to type them into the question field at any point in the GoToWebinar taskbar, but I will save questions for the end. Perry Johnson Registrars is a leading registrar. We have certified companies to a variety of standards around the world. This is not an all-inclusive list, but certainly gives an idea of our global presence. PJR is accredited to grant certification for, as I mentioned, a wide variety of standards. I've listed some examples on this slide. Obviously, that includes RIOS, the subject of today's webinar. Benefits of certification vary by standard and industry. However, in general, a quality environmental health and safety standard such as RIOS includes benefits such as improving the organization's quality environmental health and safety performance, which is abbreviated QEHS, and a minimization of QEHS risks, benefits to material sourcing and outsourcing controls. There are uh, benefits such as improvement or increase in management commitment and employee engagement, maintaining Certification to a standard like RIOS provides a competitive advantage in some industries and areas. If you have competitors who do not hold such a certification, for example, it can also serve to improve public image. In addition to that competitive advantage, there may be other potential financial benefits. In some areas, certain standard certifications may provide, for example, a discount in insurance premiums. The standard and the certification represent a framework for meeting customer and or regulatory requirements, which can also be a benefit. And it also represents a commitment to the responsible management of recyclables, which is another benefit of certification. As I mentioned, the transition deadline has passed. Anyone transitioning from RIOS 2006 to RIOS 2016 was required to do so by September 30th, 2019. The standard was revised for a number of reasons, as all standards are revised for a number of reasons, maintaining market relevance, ensuring they continue to be compatible with other management systems and other standards, ensuring they continue to be easy, easy to use and easy to implement, 
that they cover a wide variety of topics, um, even across the varying st uh, sectors and industries, that the standard continues to provide enough flexibility to be applicable to a wide variety of organizations, and continues to be easy to understand, including free from ambiguity, um, easy to translate, things like that. For anyone who was familiar with RIOS 2006, prior to RIOS 2016, some of those key changes include greater emphasis on leadership, an increased focus on proactivity and risk management, greater emphasis on the outcomes of the management system, changes to communication and awareness requirements, including both stakeholder and customer requirements. And the concept of change management was also a key change. If anyone is familiar with ISO 45001, the health and safety standard that replaces OSAS 18001, these changes are very similar. I've highlighted some of the key changes to terms and terminology in the standard on the next couple of slides. Um, you'll need to obtain a copy of the standard to be able to implement and pursue certification, so I'm not going to spend time on these definitions. You can familiarize yourselves with them within the standard as well as through the slides from today's webinar, which will be available on PGR's website should you need to reference them. I'm going to just skip through these terms. These are not all the terms in the standard, but I found these changes to be most significant or pertinent to our clients. So take a look at those when you're able and become more familiar with those terms and those changes. They may be new terms or they may be terms that have a revised definition compared to Rios 2006. Okay, so let's look a little more closely at RIOS 2016. I'm not going to go through every clause. This isn't an overview of the entire standard, I'm just highlighting the changes in RIOS 2016. So if we skip a clause, it's because nothing was significantly changed. I do wanna point out that there are notes within the standard which provide additional guidance, but are not auditable. So the notes are not meant to be treated uh, the same as the standard verbiage. Clause 1 covers general requirements. Uh, the scope needs to consider actions by outside providers as well. So this is not something that all client organizations think to include or have included in the past, so that would be a change worth noting in RIOS 2016. The footprint should also include activities performed by outside providers, such as contractors. I think you can find more examples in the standard or in the notes, but it's important to ensure if you don't already include outside provider actions or activities within the scope and the footprint that you make that change. RIOS Outcomes is a completely new section um, in RIOS 2016. It outlines implementation criteria, intended outcomes, and has a strong call uh, or tone calling for proactivity. The infrastructure requirements in Clause 1.2 include requirements for assigning responsibilities and a management representative. It requires senior management be committed, involved, and accountable. Those are emphasized throughout the standard. Senior management also needs to ensure adequate resources are available and allotted to the quality environmental health and safety management system to be able to achieve its intended outcomes. The documentation system changes are similar to those found in ISO 14001. 2015, uh, we also see them in ISO 9001, 2015, and now ISO 45001, where controlled documents can take many forms. So this shows an increase in flexibility and some updated requirements to 
uh, maintain the various types of media that we see organizations utilize to give them more flexibility to determine what form they want those uh, controls to be maintained in. Um, so we see um, that revisions encompassing both documents and records. Clause two focuses on the policy requirements. There are some additional requirements in this section compared to Rios 2006, including requirements related to evaluation of impacts and risks, annual reviews, senior management commitment, and some other applicable changes. So you'll wanna take a look at that to make sure that your, clause, your policy is revised to include all the necessary items. Clause three focuses on planning, including the Rios footprint identification. Again, we see a call or a requirement to be proactive in your approach. Assessments are to include purchasing, source material acquisition, transport, delivery, and other specified items. It's also to include positives, not just negative impacts. So that's not something that all of our client organizations had included in the past. The Rios footprint needs to be kept up to date, reviewed for changes, and assessed prior to making any changes that could impact the QEHSMS, which again stands for Quality Environmental Health and Safety Management System. So when we're talking about assessing prior to making changes, we're talking about that change management concept, which is new to Rios 2016, and we'll talk more about that later in the standard. Clause three is broken up into subsections looking at quality, environmental, and health and safety risks separately. So 3.1.1 covers important quality risks. This is a new section. This, this breakdown is new. So the quality risk subsection requires the identification and control of risks affecting product and or service quality. You'll see in the terms and definitions section that risk is the effect of uncertainty and can be positive or negative. Some examples of the quality risks you might encounter are not limited to this list, but just a couple examples. Employee theft, ineffective training, departure of key employees, equipment or tool breakdown, etc. We also see those subsections for environmental impacts and health and safety risks, as I mentioned. So there are some additional requirements, including the documentation of rating criteria and controls that you can find in those sections of the standard. 3.1.4 focuses on legal requirements. This includes product requirements as well, and the controls need to be documented. So those would be the key changes in regards to legal requirements. Product, service, and customer requirements is another new section. It requires the documentation of requirements as well as monitoring methodologies for specified topics, products, customer requirements, outsourced activities, source material specifications. Um, the rest of the list can be found within the standard. I just wanted to give you an idea of what we're talking about here. It also requires verification as well as records of conformity. Other stakeholder requirements are found in the next subsection, also new 3.1.6, requires the identification of stakeholders and their respective requirements. You can see a lot of these changes um, mirror or echo some of the ISO 14001, 2015, and ISO 45001 contents, if you're familiar with those standards. Controls are to be implemented accordingly to meet those stakeholder requirements. This is to be reviewed annually. And you can take a look at the stakeholder definition in the terms and definitions section to make sure you understand what that means and that you've encompassed all relevant stakeholders for your organization. Examples might include owners, landlords, insurance companies. Those are some of the less obvious examples um, just to kind of get you started. Improvement planning covers goals, 
Um, the establishment of goals has specified inputs or items to at least be considered in 3.2.1, whereas 3.2.2 .2 covers plans for goal achievement and requires written plans identifying tasks, resource needs, assigned responsibilities, due dates, and methods for evaluating the results. So if your goals and objectives don't already meet all of those criteria, that will be an area that you'll want to focus on as well. The change management section I referenced, this new concept or new section can be found in 3.3. This requires a written plan to review the footprint for relevant changes prior to implementing a change to the QEHSMS. So we're talking about evaluating those changes prior to implementing them, which goes hand in hand with that call for proactivity or that tone of proactivity that we see throughout RIOS 2016. Clause four focuses on implementation. <clears throat> Competency requirements need to be identified. Records need to be maintained as evidence of competence and effectiveness also needs to be verified. There are identified criteria to consider within the training expectations. Those can be found in 4.1.1. And this is as relevant to the intended outcomes of the QHSMS or the ability of those personnel or job titles to affect the ability of the management system's achievement of intended outcomes. So training or competency requirements may vary by job title, for example. Some roles will be more or less able to affect those intended outcomes. And the competency requirements can um, be tiered or uh, reflect that uh, ability. Awareness requirements are found in 4.1.2, and this section does have some additional awareness topics or requirements compared to RIOS 2006 uh, that you'll want to check out. Communication is found in 4.2, and RIOS 2016 requires documentation of communication plans. Communic uh, communication with customers has some additional requirements, including customer qualifications, if there are any, as well as any customer requirements that would be relevant to QEH or S. Similarly, there are some additional supplier communication criteria in 4.2.3 subsection, uh, communication of source control requirements, load rejections, errors, et cetera. So you'll want to take a look at that to understand if or how that applies to your organization, if it differs from how you currently manage your supplier communications as well. 4.2.4 focuses on outside supplier communication. This replaces the contractor communication section with from RIOS 2006 and has some clarified or changed language um, compared to the previous version. 4.2.5 covers external communication. It requires communication of relevant quality environmental health and safety information with visitors, stakeholders, et cetera. Those are just a couple examples. Examples of what you might communicate could include, but are not limited to emergency plans, reporting on-site chemicals to the fire department, tier two chemical reporting, just a couple examples. Operational controls are covered in section 4.3. 4.3.1 focuses on source materials. This section is restructured. These requirements were previously found in the supplier section for RIOS 2006. Um, it also contains clarified requirements and expanded control expectations. So take a look at that section if that applies to you. Outsourced providers, products, and services are covered in 4.3.2. This is also restructured and was found in the contractor section of RIOS 2006. In RIOS 2016, you'll see some additional requirements similar to purchasing controls, such as documented specifications, 
controls relative to the potential QBHS impact, records of evaluation and monitoring, just a couple examples. 4.4 is a new section focusing on quality controls. RIOS 2016 requires documentation of quality control specifications and requirements, worker instructions, and a couple other items. So take a look at 4.4 to learn more about those quality control requirements. Similarly, we see environmental control and health and safety control uh, sections added to RIOS 2016. Uh, similar to the quality control section, these require documented controls to address or minimize environmental impacts or health and safety hazards, respectively. For health and safety, this could include hazards related to outsourcing, source materials, contractors, off-site activities, chemicals, equipment itself, a whole host of things. There are no significant changes to the emergency preparedness requirements found in 4.7, uh, but the expectation is certainly that you will communicate uh, those requirements per Clause 4.2. Clause 5 covers checking and corrective action topics. As far as monitoring and measurement, there are some additional items to be included in your monitoring and measurement plans compared to RIOS 2006. So you'll want to take a closer look at Clause 5.1 as well as 5.1.1 there's additional items to be monitored as well. 5.1.2 focuses on compliance. So an annual evaluation of legal and stakeholder requirements is required. Um, if memory serves, Rios 2006 did not have a minimum frequency requirement. Now that is annual. There's also additional verbiage here about competency requirements for the person evaluating compliance or doing that compliance evaluation. So take a look at that section and make sure your current compliance evaluation process continues to meet the requirements of RIOS or that you make those necessary changes. In terms of maintenance and calibration for monitoring equipment, there are some additional requirements including documentation of requirements and any actions taken to address out of tolerance monitoring devices. So that is new. You'll want to take a look at that section to see what else might be new. 5.1.4 requires the outputs of monitoring and measuring be included as inputs in the management review. In terms of nonconformances and corrective or preventive action, EHS incidents and investigations are covered in subsection 5.2.2. This is a new section for RIOS. It requires investigation of all EHS incidents. And I just want to remind everyone that per the definition of incident, near misses would be included in those and should be investigated under RIOS 2016. This section also requires that previous nonconformities for two whole audit cycles be reviewed for effectiveness. Previously, the requirement was just one audit cycle. So you'll notice that during your audits with PJR, we're looking at uh, NCRs that go back two years, not just the previous year. Um, we're past the transition phase, but I will note that RIOS 2016 also requires all NCRs for an, a recertification audit, even minors, include evidence of effective implementation prior to acceptance and closure. So what this means is that going forward, your recertification audits to RIOS 2016 um, will require implementation of minor NCRs and evidence accordingly. So whereas um, you would have had to have an acceptable plan um, written in past tense to show that it was implemented. Now, as a registrar or a certification body, we're required to check and verify that it's been implemented and that it's effective uh, before accepting and closing that finding rather than waiting until the next year to see that evidence. 
So that's a change for minor NCRs. Internal RIOS audits are required annually with full system evaluations. It specifies that these should be prior to certification or recertification. So you'll want to make sure if you don't already that you schedule your internal audits to take place before your third party certification body audits, um, such as PJR. So especially important for your recertification audit cycle, that internal audit really needs to be performed before PJR does their audit so that we can look at that evidence. Um, that's a requirement of RIOS 2016. There's some additional details and requirements um, for the written plan for your internal audits as well found in 5.3. And there are some additional clarifications and required inputs and outputs found in clause six for management reviews. Okay, so those are the key changes for RIOS 2016. Um, for anyone who is already familiar with RIOS 2006 and just wants to kind of understand those key changes or some of those key requirements that differ from RIOS 2006. For anyone who is new to the certification process, I just want to briefly go over what that looks like, what that registration or certification process looks like initially. So the first step would be to purchase the standard itself so you can understand and see those requirements for yourself in their entirety. For Rios, you have to contact Michelle Woody to purchase a copy of the standard. And I've included her email address on the screen. Next steps include establishing quality environmental health and safety management system documentation to meet the requirements of the standard, train to meet those requirements, implement those requirements, including conducting an internal audit, conducting a compliance evaluation, and conducting a management review after the internal audit so the results of the internal audit can serve as an input to that management review so that you have all of that evidence to show your auditor when they perform your audits. You'll also need a contract with a certification body such as PJR to conduct your audits and maintain your certification. You'll then complete a stage one audit and then subsequently a stage two audit. Address any nonconformities that may result from the stage two audit before you can be issued a certificate. So that stage one audit process is a documentation review of the management system. I should update this slide. It doesn't necessarily have to be on site. In some cases, we're able to do that as a virtual audit um, or an offsite audit in light of the pandemic <laughs> that we are currently working through. Um, so the documentation for that review may be required to be submitted to PJR before the stage one to ensure your readiness for the stage one audit. But the purpose of the stage one audit is to review that system documentation to evaluate the organization's readiness for that stage two audit, which takes place after the stage one, not immediately after the stage one. There's some time in between. And this would be an audit of the entire management system all of the shifts and all of the processes would be sampled to get a sense of or to evaluate how those standard requirements have been implemented and whether your organization is effectively meeting the requirements of the standard. You may have nonconformities issued at a stage two audit. Those would need to be addressed through the corrective action process before a certificate could be issued. Once the certificate is issued, which are good for three years, you enter the surveillance cycle for the next two years. These would be either annual or semi-annual audits, partial system audits, um, so we wouldn't necessarily sample all of the processes and all of the shifts. They should be a little bit shorter just to continue to assess and monitor how the system is being maintained and whether it continues to meet the standard requirements. The third year of that cycle represents the recertification audit, very similar to the stage two in that it's a full system audit, um, and this would result in a new certificate, again, three years, restarting that, that uh, cycle all over again. Okay, so if you haven't already done so, feel free to type in your questions. 
I'll check those in just a moment. In the meantime, I want to put our contact information up on the screen. Should you have any technical questions or specific questions that you'd like to discuss offline, you can contact um, either myself or the EHS program manager with PJR. So again, my name is Austin Matthews. I can be contacted via email or the main PGR phone number. They can put you through to my extension and I am available to help as much as I'm able. We also have our EHS program manager, Stacy DeSantis, who can also be contacted by email or by phone. Um, for standard specific questions about the intent of the requirements or how to implement them, um, in some cases, we have to recommend that you go to Rios um, specifically as we can't consult. We have to be careful to maintain um, those boundaries, but I'll do my best to help you and point you in the right direction and let you know if, uh, if Rios is the next step for your question. I've also included the main number for our sales department with PJR in case you are looking for a quote or are a prospective new client, um, the sales department would be a great place to start to understand uh, those next steps. So let's see if we have any questions. Okay, I don't see any so far. I'll hang out for another minute in case someone is typing. I can't see that. But in the meantime, um, I just want to say thank you for joining us today. A copy of today's slides, as well as a recording of today's webinar, will be made available on PGR's website in the next couple of days. So if you'd like to have that to reference, keep an eye out for that um, to be posted. Again, reach out with any questions that you might have. Hopefully, you've already transitioned since the transition deadline has passed. But if you are pursuing certification for the first time, I hope the webinar was helpful in highlighting some of those key requirements and key changes. So since there are no questions, I'll go ahead and sign off. Thank you again for joining us today. I hope you have a great day.